from the Computer History Museum in the heart of Silicon Valley. It's the Cube, covering food IT, fork to farm. Brought to you by Western Digital. Hey, welcome back to theCUBE. I'm Lisa Martin. We are at the Food IT Fork to Farm event at the Computer History Museum talking with amazing guests from farmers to technologists helping to uh, increase uh, the sustainability and uh, the food chain. Next we're joined by Michael Bacar, the director of Google Food. Michael, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, it's great to be here. Well, so we're in Google's backyard here at the Computer History Museum and I've always heard of Google food is fantastic. And I, uh, you're going to hear it here first, Michael didn't invite me, I have his card, I've never, I've never been able to eat at one of the restaurants, <laughs> but now I have it on film. Jack. <laughs> <laughs> so, but tell me about, you come from a hospitality background, Google food, what was your um, segue into hospitality to being the director of food for Google? So I worked for many, many great years for Starwood Hotels and Resorts for 15 years over in the US and my last two years with them, I was responsible for our food and beverage operation in Europe, Middle East and Africa. So amazing times in Europe at the time we were building out our hotel portfolio in the Middle East. Um, and while I was there, I got this call from that company out of Mountain View, Google and said, would you be interested in having a conversation with us about our food program? That piqued my interest. I'd never heard of their food program and how they were thinking and running food. So that led to a very fascinating uh, interview journey. And a year after the initial call, I started over here in March of 2012, and I've loved every minute of it since. Well, your passion, I was telling you, I've seen some videos of you online, and your passion for it is really clear. What was it that Google was looking for you to help facilitate five years ago? So prior to my arrival, we had three great regional teams that were responsible for everything that they were doing with food in their respective regions. My bosses at the time were very aware of how we would continue to grow, and they were aware of both the challenges and the opportunities of growing our program with the same rate of the growth of Google. So they were looking for an individual who could bring structure as well as scalability options for our program. So my role was in the beginning to really to think through how can you get Google Food ready for ongoing growth for a great number of years. So one of the things that's interesting about this event, and I, I kept thinking I was misreading the title, Fork or uh, fork to farm, mm -hmm. and I, you, we're so used to, and the trend of farm to table, and fork to farm, the consumer, the tech savvy consumer, being very influential, organic, cage free, hormone free. Of course, you are now at the hub of technology. Everyone in the world knows Google. Everyone's got a million devices. Talk to us about how you're using technology at Google to improve the relationships with suppliers, the, the type of supply of food that you get. Yeah, so it starts really with the user. So we believe that our role is to enable individuals to make personal, informed food choices. So personalization that truly has to do with how we live and work these days. It's about me, I want it now, I want it whatever I want, whenever I want it and whatever I want. And I think that technology can, can play a great role in that. So we've developed internally an app that will help actually users to find whatever they're looking for. Um, so that will be one. But if you can go further back into the food chain, then you get the question, is there data, technology, or platforms out there that might help us with what we call that food transparency or food uh, insights, where you can really to think through how might we help a consumer to determine where food is coming from, what is in my food, what are the, nu the nutrients, and I think just as importantly, we don't really speak about it as much, where does my food waste go to? Because we're very focused on what I get, we're less interested today where it actually is going to. So we're thinking through what can we develop internally, what is already available in the broader Google or Alphabet portfolio. If you think about Google search, if you think about YouTube, there are a lot of platforms or tools out there that can help individuals to make those informed food choices. 
And then I think what is harder if you go further up the food chain in really determining how can you trace a product from the farm or from the boat all the way back up to the consumer. And I think that is a journey that many partners, many stakeholders in the food system continue to work on. That's a big challenge because there's a tremendous amount of money that can be lost. I was reading that California supplies 90% of the world's almonds. Mm -hmm. In the last three years, there's been over 35 truckloads of almonds that have disappeared. Yeah. And the traceability being a massive challenge and that's tantamount right. to, to $10 million. But you touched on something really interesting and that's the personalization. We want it with everything, right? right? We are so tech enabled and tech savvy um, and we, we want to, you mentioned transparency, yeah. that's essential. So talk to us about what is it that you're learning from, so is, I presume it's an app that, that Googlers have access yeah. to. How are you using that big data and analytics to influence the next generation of Google Food? So I think at the beginning of that, so with the Eat app, so that's the app that we have internally, it's you have in a profile as well, and you can set up your profile in such a way about the foods you like, and the which you would like to avoid. So you can apply the filters. So what we now get, the more people within our organization that would use the app, the better insights we're going to get of what ultimately, what percentage is vegetarian or what percentage is actually vegan or flexitarian. So you get a better insight of where do you have what percentage of your population sit so you can ultimately develop offerings that resonate with your population. And so you also talked about food waste. I was reading a McKinsey and Company report that reports that about one third of all food produced in the world is lost or wasted, which accounts uh, for about $940 billion yeah. worldwide. And we kind of think, oh, sometimes we get a little, me, overzealous at the grocery store, we have these plans. So how are you using the data that you're gathering from your Eat app to reduce food waste across Google? We don't really use that app for that yet, but we're working with a great company called LeanPath. So LeanPath is a technology platform company that enables you to track food waste uh, in a kitchen environment. So every time when a chef throws something out, we weigh it, we take a picture of it, and we tag it. And as a result of having done that now for a couple of years, we have a very large global database with these food waste moments. And then what you can do in an individual kitchen, you can analyze of actually what is driving food waste in your kitchen. And I think what we've learned, two things happen. So the first one is because you're pay paying attention to food waste, you get the Hawthorne effect, people pay more attention to it, and as a result of that, you will reduce food waste with that. But secondly, you ultimately learn of what is driving food waste in a specific kitchen. And then I think with that we've learned as well that it becomes complex. For example, we really would like our users, the rest of the world, to eat more vegetables and more fruit. So we've learned that in our kitchens, a big part of our food waste is driven by vegetables. So now you get these two interesting conflicts because you can say on the one hand, if I want to reduce food waste, I should actually be scrappier with the vegetables. But at the same time, we would like our users to eat more vegetables. So ultimately, what is more important? And I think with that, we've learned it's about the value of a product. And then to think through, we're probably better off focusing on reducing the waste of meat versus ultimately reducing the waste of a carrot. The environmental impact of meat is significantly larger, and therefore you need to ultimately focus your efforts on where can you make the biggest impact within the available capacity that you have. Now have you, this is so interesting, have you gone on like the speaking circuit to educate other, not just tech companies or, or businesses that want to scale, but uh, there could be so much l from the, the learning that right. you've done with big data and analytics to educate other businesses, even down to, to the farms. Is that something that's part of, uh, of your? So our team and I would actually attend, will attend various conferences around the world, but I think we're very focused on learning more and making a bigger impact and then sharing at the right opportune moment because you can spend your whole life chatting about what you have done or are thinking of doing. Ultimately, we're an organization that is feeding a lot of individuals on a daily basis in a very responsible way, and we want to learn more. We're only at the beginning of figuring out where we can make a bigger impact. And how have you done, um, how have you 
been able to facilitate the scale? You were mentioning before we went live, the when you started year, five years ago, yeah. the number of people you fed then that you feed now. How has cloud computing, big data analytics, machine learning helped drive that scale that Google wanted to see? So I think we are very focused on collaboration. So it's actually finding partners who are either just as excited about the opportunities, are better at what you do, and are willing to do stuff together. Because I think by working more with others, you increase your overall reach, you learn more together, and therefore you become better at what you do. So I think an, an interesting opportunity for us is we're feeding a wide variety of teams at Google and Alphabet on a daily basis, and they are engaged with food. So sometimes you find a team or an individual that might not necessarily be as focused on food, but they're looking actually in, in real world challenge that they can use for their emerging technology. So you can find different starting points to ultimately to bring people together to address a common challenge. Food waste is an interesting one. So we now have the database, and now the question is how might you deploy machine learning to learn stuff you've never thought about? We're at the beginning of that. So we have a long way to go. Besides food waste, what, what's maybe kind of the next thing on your horizon for the rest of 2017 to influence? It is like how can you move your population to move to a more balanced, plant forward diet? But doing it in such a way where people actually are willingly and excitedly join you on that journey versus it getting stuck in the conversation is you're telling me what I cannot do or you're taking something away from me. So it really becomes how can you make the alternative which might be a, a cuisine type or a concept with where meat is not necessarily the center of the plate, just as exciting or if not more exciting than what we're doing as of today. Wow, so interesting. Well, I'm looking forward to my lunch with you <laughs> at one of the Google restaurants. Yeah. Michael, thank you so much for joining us here and sharing what you're doing at Google. It's been a pleasure. And we want to thank you for watching as well. Again, Lisa Martin live at the uh, Food IT Fork to Farm event in Silicon Valley. Stick around, we'll be right back.